Welcome to part three of the only thing you need to know about an active shooter. Now listen, the response we've been getting has been incredible. Yes, this is why I wanted to put this presentation out there to you. Ed has a lot of great information and, you know, this series of events that we're, that we're sharing with you really will give you a very complete picture of what the most important thing is when it comes to surviving uh, an active shooter situation. It's an uncomfortable subject, but Ed really puts it out, takes the politics out of it. And I can see just from the responses I'm getting from people, the frustration that you have with some of the ways this is talked about in other groups. Uh, that's why I thought it was so important to see this presentation. So thank you. But welcome to part three. And um, again, you know, Ed has a very unique way of putting this information out. Um, that's why I like, you know, his presentation. He's very down to earth. Um, so let's get right back into it. How are we going to deal with it? Um, most organizations I talk to, it's hope and denial and just do what the last guy did. Instead, we need to use math and logic. First, we'll talk about individuals. Every individual, no matter where you are, if an active shooter attack kicks off, you have three options. Fight, flee, and barricade. The federal government is run, hide, fight. I think that sucks. Fight, flee, barricade. I put fight first because fight is best for humanity. The sooner somebody successfully fights him, the lower the victim count will be. I want low victim count. So someone needs to fight this guy. But if you won't, or if you can't, option two is to flee. Not run, it runs part of it. Run, crawl, slither, jump, however you can get away from the bad man shooters. Baby rabbits know to run away from somebody shooting at them with a gun. They didn't go to rabbit school to be taught that, they, it's wired in them, they know that. And we know it too. We know if we're not gonna fight somebody trying to kill us, we should try to get away from someone trying to kill us. So we've gotta stop making artificial rules like in schools where the teachers force the kids to stay put and let the shooter come and execute them. That's been going on for far too long. Barricade is not, an, not really a choice, barricade's a default. If you cannot fight and you cannot flee, then by default you barricade and that's not hide. Don't hide and wait to be killed, barricade. Get behind a door, lock it if it's lockable. No matter if it is ridden, rip, pile, carry everything that's movable in that room and put it up against that door. Pile it up there. And then you don't hide, you have a welcoming party for him at the entrance to that door. Coming through a barricaded door is an extremely hard thing to do and you're extremely vulnerable when you do it. Most of these shooters have long guns. So trying to force your way through a barricaded door while holding a rifle or a shotgun, you're extremely vulnerable. Have the people in there on both sides of that door and deal with whatever he pushes through that door. If his head comes through, crush it like a grape with whatever's in that room, a coffee pot, a computer, a podium, whatever you got. If he sticks his arm through, break his arm. If he sticks the gun through, grab the gun and get ready to fight because most of them have multiple guns and they may have another one. People have to be taught that that's okay and taught how to do it effectively. That's individuals. Uh, this is organizations. What I took far too long in my 13 years to realize was that most citizens do not have experience in planning for things like this. I, it's second nature in the military, so I was, curious, I was dumbfounded why they weren't doing it. They'd never been trained to do it. It's something very simple called end state planning. You, may, you base all of your planning off what you want at the end. Most of us are familiar with Alice in Wonderland where she comes up to a fork in the path. I can go one way, I can go another way. She asked the cat, which of these paths should I take? He says, well, where do you wanna go? And she says, well, I don't really know. And he says, well, then any path will do. And that's the problem. We're not starting with where we wanna go. We're just downloading something off the internet and, and putting it in the book because we're required to have a plan. This is really simple. You start with what you want it to look like when the attack is over. So simply, how many people do you want shot on the ground when the active shooter attack is over? How many do you want? Well, I want zero. Well, get beyond that, okay? What is the maximum number you're willing to put up with? Decide that and then build a plan that has a real, that doesn't hope for the, at the end. It has a realistic, statistical, historical data driven chance and expectation to get you that result that you want. Again, I'm trying to nudge them into this. So I tell them you gotta have two parts to this plan. 
you got to have a you got to have a, a part of your plan that deters future attacks. And I can show you s several active shooters in their writings and in their comments afterwards where they planned on attacking place A or B, but then decided not to because they had too much security. The, the only way you can really get a zero is you make him decide to go attack another place because he knows he can't get the high victim count that he wants at your place. But I can't, I can't offer any location, any organization, a plan that will guarantee them deterrence. So you gotta have the second part, and that is if deterrence fails and he does attack your location, you have a plan that has a realistic expectation of stopping him in the first 30 seconds. Why 30 seconds? That's random. No, it's not. If you look back at attacks, if you stop him in the first 30 seconds, you have a, not a guarantee, but a very real data-driven expectation that you'll have single-digit victims. My, what I offer organizations as a goal is single-digit victims. If, if you don't want that, then what is your goal? But not zero. You can't plan for zero. You got to have a realistic plan. I offer them single digits, one to nine. I'd rather have zero, but if he comes there to kill people and we get one to nine, we've done a good job. So now what plan can an organization use to actually get this other than hope? I see three options. Option one, wait on responding police to show up after someone eventually makes that 911 call after the radio call to dispatch the cops, after the cops travel, after they arrive, after they get in the building and after they shoot. Wait on all that to happen. You, that is your plan, it could be your plan, or if, if, you, if an organization doesn't have any plan, that, that is the plan by default. The next is to have law enforcement or armed guards on the property. Many schools have resource officers, many churches and bars hire off-duty cops for security. That's another option, but that just puts them somewhere on the property. You know, schools can have multiple buildings. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna see or hear the shooting when it starts. And then option three is to allow people that are already there, adults that are already at this, at this organization to be armed and defend themselves. Those are the three options, okay? No matter which one you choose of those three, they all work equally well. And on every day, you'll get the same result except the day the active shooter shows up. On that day, you will get drastically different results based on what, it, what your plan was. Option one, let's just call 911 and let the professionals come take care of it. Well, that's an option, but that option gets very ugly numbers because math's a bitch. So if you don't want those numbers, which history shows us that plan has gotten, why would you have a plan that gets that bad of results. Why in the world would you have a plan that gets double and triple digit victim counts? Oh, but the cops say they can be here pretty quick, okay? But that's pretty quick after they get called. There's already three, four, five minutes gone by before they get called, then they gotta travel. So notice the top four up there, a police officer was already on the property. They didn't even have to drive there. And then the ones below it, very good response time, three minutes, but look at the results of police on the property or police arriving within three minutes after they were called. It's ugly. I don't want those results, so I don't want that plan. And to zoom in on the top, notice all those had uniformed armed officers on the property. Santa Fe High School, the bottom one, had two uniformed armed officers on the property, and we still have double and triple digits. Having cops on the property is not 100% deterrent, and it's not a guarantee of low victim count. I always recommend option three. Why? Well, Ed, because you're a gun guy. Yeah, I am a gun guy. Well, because you're a conservative. Yeah, I'm mostly conservative, but this has nothing to do with politics or my hobbies. This has to do with math and time and facts of history and data. I said it before, every time in our country except one, every attack in our country except one, when a armed, good armed person was present, close enough to hear it or see it, and acted aggressively, we have a one to nine victim count. Dayton, Ohio is the only exception. 95% success, you show me something that has a better than 95% success rate, I'm willing to talk, I'd love to hear it. And let, let's all adopt what you've got if you can show me something with a better success rate. Armed citizens have never shot the wrong person in responding to an active shooter. Cops have several times. So armed citizens actually have a better track record than cops do. These are the results we want. The only one not up here is Dayton.
The ones on the bottom with the blue asterisk were police officers on and off duty who acted, who were present, heard it or saw it, acted aggressively and stopped it. God love them, brave people. But the ones on top without a blue asterisk were just armed citizens who were present, heard it or saw it, acted aggressively and stopped them. The badge is irrelevant. What matters are three things. Are you there? Are you armed? And will you act? Those are the only thing that matters with or without a badge. Hey, everybody. Hey, if you're enjoying this content, please take the time to go to surviveviolence.com. Give us your email. Allow us to send you and give you a free masterclass on how to deal with the subjects that we talk about on this channel. Also, please join the channel. Uh, hit the subscribe button, notification button, and please share this with all your friends. Thank you. When I bring this up, let's let people in churches be armed. Let's let staff at school be armed. Let's let staff in uh, workplace be armed. Oh my God, that's when the political and emotional bumper sticker, knee jerking, boogeyman stuff starts. It's not logical. It's not driven by data. It's just something emotionally or politically that they just can't get over. So here's just some of the, the things I always hear. Let's leave it to the professionals, the cop. That's why we have cops. Well, you know, shooters go out of their way. Active shooters go out of their way to not start their shooting right in front of a cop. So if it doesn't start where a cop can hear it or see it, you're going to have that delay, and that delay is going to give you a high body count. I got no problem with letting cops handle it if the cops are there and can act very quickly after the first shot is fired. Sometimes cops aren't aggressive even though they're there or even after they arrive, Columbine, Binghamton, Parkland, maybe others, maybe Sandy Hook. But even if you've got the most aggressive, professional, well-trained cop in the world, if he doesn't show up until five minutes after the first shot, you're going to have a body count. But the average citizen doesn't have the great police training that cops get, so there's no way they could do this. They'll make a mistake. Well, but data doesn't support that. Cops have made several mistakes, shooting the wrong people. Cops have shot and killed each other twice responding to an active shooter. Citizens have never shot the wrong person. I always laugh a little inside when I'm at a school and they say, you know, it's no problem having a cop come in here, but we don't want any of our staff having guns. It's just too unsafe. It's like a high school graduate who went to the police academy can, can be trusted with a Glock pistol, but the teacher with a master's degree that teaches AP calculus just can't figure out a pistol. He's just too ignorant and stupid to figure out a pistol. It makes no sense. Shooting a handgun is aptly a simple task. But these active shooters are horrible, Navy SEAL, Ninja, Mad Dog, super duper crazy. The average person can't go up against these people. No. Doesn't bear it out. Most of these active shooters are punks that barely know how to make their dad's gun go bang. Now they're dangerous because they show up in a crowded place with a gun. As long as they can make it go bang, they're going to hurt some people. They are extremely dangerous, but they're not very well trained at all. And several times armed citizens have effectively stopped them. It, it, it has worked. This is the one you'll hear a lot. We can't let citizens, armed citizens on site have guns, because if they pull their gun to stop the active shooter, when the cop shows up, the cop will misidentify the good person holding the gun, and the cop will shoot the, act, the, the good person holding the gun by mistake. This is probably the most common one that I hear. And so I say, when has that ever happened? It's never happened. Why has it never happened? Dumb luck? No, math and time. If someone is present that hears or sees the shooting when it starts and ends it in 30 to 60 seconds, it'll be over before the first 911 call is made. You'll be on your third cigarette by the time the first cop shows up. If someone present ends it, I don't care if it's a citizen or an off-duty cop. I don't care who. End it quickly. Keep the numbers low. Don't wait till the cops get there and have high numbers. And if you get past politics and emotion and you actually use logic, if you truly believe this, that we cannot let anybody in civilian clothes have a gun and pull it out in an active shooter because of this fratricide problem, then logically and consistently, you would have to also say you don't want off-duty cops pulling their guns either and stopping an active shooter. But of course, no one would say that because everybody wants an off-duty cop to stop it if it's there. And there have been several cases of off-duty brave cops pulling their guns off-duty and stopping active killers. So you just can't get past the emotions and the politics of having armed people. Well, okay, then what are you left with? you're left with very ugly math because there's gonna be a huge time delay and there's gonna be a lot of bodies on the ground. I'm tired of high body counts and we've had them for over 30 years. We've gotta do something different. 
frustration that I've been doing this over 10 years uh, to get organizational leaders to take ownership of the security of that of their organization. You know, I tell superintendents, the cops are not responsible for the safety in this school. It's the superintendent. So take ownership of the victim count if an active shooter comes here and take ownership of what we're gonna do to make that as low as possible. Get beyond zero, because zero is hope. We gotta get beyond hope and plan for reality. And that is, we're gonna know we're in an active shooter attack after the first couple of shots and after the first person's already been shot. So now we're past zero, let's keep it at a minimum. What's our goal? Get organizational leaders thinking about how are we gonna act to limit the casualties by stopping it quickly versus hoping somebody stops it. Those are two entirely different things. Get organizations to make plans for the day the shooter shows up, not plans that look good in a notebook that pass some kind of inspection. To make plans that'll actually save lives. And we gotta stop treating patients with leeches. For 30 years, we've been treating the patients with the same old remedy of leeches and they keep dying. We got to come up with a new treatment that gets different results. So math and time, if you get nothing out of this presentation, it's math and time. That's what we got to look at. And I'm a history major. I can do this math. Okay. On average, one person shot every 10 seconds. Stopping him quickly will give us a low body count, not just stopping him, stopping him quickly. The only way to stop him quickly is to eliminate the need for a 911 call a radio dispatch call, police driving, police entering a building, and police finally stopping. If any organization, their plan requires a 911 call, their plan is double digit victims. There we go. So there's my information, my name, my cell number, my email address. Tim, thanks so much. And uh, everyone who eventually watches this thing, uh, I wish I could discuss more attacks in detail. I did the lethal force conference up in Boise, which is where I met Rory and did seven hours of this and talked about over 35 uh, specific examples and talked about how to train for it and other things. Um, I'll gladly do this again. I can gladly go into any other aspects of it at all. And I know we're gonna talk after, but I travel all over the country giving presentations at conferences to law enforcement, churches, to schools, to government agencies. Um, I, it's a a frustrating passion of mine to try to get people to look at reality and start doing something different. So every time we hear there's an active shooter, we don't also hear, oh, there was 20, 30, 40 people shot. We've got to start doing different. And it's right in front of us. There is something that will lower the victim count. And we've got to start doing that. Okay, folks, that's it for that segment of the interview. Hope you're enjoying this multi-part series. We'll be posting more content soon. And until then, Please remember, go to surviveviolence.com, give us your email address, get your free master class. Make sure that you join this channel. You know, the Tim Larkin channel is growing really fast, but I need your help. So not only subscribe to the channel, hit notifications, but more importantly, share it with your folks. Let them see one video that particularly got to you. That would really, really help us as we are growing the channel. Until next time, all the best.